Hi. Uh, apologies for interrupting you in last week's podcast. That was so funny. I was walking towards the podium and Kevin says, look who's on. <laughs> <laughs> and you have come on at such a funny time. Like Rob was just explaining something about being a couple steps ahead or something. And you're like, of course you are. <laughs> you just kind of were there and then you were gone. But I got to spend Monday night yeah. sleeping on a couch on a thing in the Denver airport. The plane was there, but the pilots couldn't get there because of thunderstorms on the East Coast. So the FAA reduced traffic out of Toronto, I guess the southernmost east part of Canada, whatever that is, New York, Newark, Philadelphia, and Charlotte, North Carolina. Because if they could get out of those cities and between thunderstorms, they couldn't get across the Midwest. So they had to route them all down south of Atlanta to get around the thunderstorms in the Midwest to get over to Denver. So I slept on a couch. Monday night, but I got home on Tuesday. You mean like a set of seats? I got a seat because I used the app while everybody else was standing in line. Before they even canceled the flight, I knew it was going to be canceled because once they delayed it three oh, hours, it's gone. Yeah. So I got a middle so I paid for a first class seat. I got a middle seat on the 27th row and was grateful for it. Sometimes it's just those little things that just you're like, I'm getting home. I'm on the plane and I'm going home. And it's that thing where you don't get to choose what happens to you. Just get to choose how you respond. Okay. Hey, so once again, you have knocked it out of the park with the way you are speaking. And what part of my piece of paper says for today. And people don't understand that we really don't plan these podcasts out together. Like I have a running tally of things that I want to pick up that we never finished from the last one. And then things that I want to talk about. And then the week starts and the weekend and then things morph and then you start saying things. So part of the thing I have circled today is anxiety and letting go. Oh, yeah. And trusting the process. And I think regardless if you're working with somebody who has had chronic pain or has had just a very rough go at rehab or somebody who's in sports, there is so much that is outside of our control that we have to remind the people that we're working with that we're all doing the best that we can but healing's going to heal when healing's done. And life happens. Yes. And I, the only thing you can choose is how you respond. Correct. Sometimes in order to choose that, I mean, by the time you're 76, it's a habit. I was first told that when I was 22. Okay. And I went, shut up. And then... You start practicing it and get getting better and better at it after worse and worse. Like the things you thought were awful when you were 22, by the time you're 45, you've been through so much worse. That it's, yeah. And it becomes a habit. That choice to expect a positive response no matter what happens. It's whatever it is, it's going to work out okay. Really? Uh, okay. And that is a very tough concept for people who not necessarily struggle with anxiety, but who are controlling type people. Oh. So your executives, your high-level athletes, there is a certain amount of control that these people need to have. And when you have an injury, that control is gone. Well, and... The truth of the matter, as a psychologist and having dealt with people that need to have control, 
<laughs> if you start asking the question that no one wants to ask, so you ask, have you had any surgeries? What sort of accidents have you had? Were you ever molested, abused, physically or emotionally, prior to the age of 12? And it's, and you can actually say molested, abused, or raped, period, no age range. Molested physically or emotionally, abused physically or emotionally, or raped, no timeline. The data says that it's 80% of healthcare providers were adult children of alcoholics. And at the chiropractic college, for sure, there were 10 of us. I counted. There were 10 of us. And I said, hey, are any of you adult children of alcoholics? Eight. Every time I did that. Eight. Wow. And this, it's the same thing with chronically ill patients. It's you get used to taking every care of everybody but yourself and in order to protect yourself you have to be able to control your environment okay. so you learn not to be weak because sometimes that results in you being abused so it's a question nobody wants to ask and because after my master's I worked at Planned Parenthood I was trained to ask that question. Right. And I talk about this in the core, in the same tone of voice, in this, after you ask the easy questions, surgery in 1991, 2006, I did this, I had that accident, I broke my leg, and have you ever been molested, abused, or raped? Oh, and they, and by then they're used to answering. and they end up saying it without thinking about it unless it was really bad. And then they'll stop for a second, but then they'll usually answer it if you're matter of fact about it. And if you don't make eye contact, right. If you're not a threat and you're just looking at a piece of paper, waiting, glance yeah. up. Right. Yes. No, I don't care. And then you, if you're lucky, you run into somebody like you that, coaches them that you're going to be okay and that you help them make that transition that says you don't get to control this and that's a new concept for someone that has always controlled everything in that's order right. to save their life that's right and there's been a lot of practitioners, or there's been a lot of patients that I've seen throughout the years who want this definite timeline. How many treatments is, gonna, is this going to take? I don't know. I heard you say two, two treatments a week for four to six weeks. Ideally, we'll see a good dent in your symptoms during that time frame. But I always say to people, anybody that promises you a definite timeline you need to turn around and walk the other way because science and doesn't work like that. We're given time frames in textbooks that were written 60 years ago based on a multitude of factors, right? Like everybody is unique. So the patients that are listening, you bring your own set of frequencies to a clinician. And no pun intended, you are at a completely state. different molecular state than you were yesterday. And your own set of background. And my answer is it depends on where we're starting from. Totally. Absolutely. If you've had three failed back surgeries, the timeline is completely different than if you've had no back surgeries and two car accidents. Like we had patients walk in for the after the class demos. One of them had a history, you know, the history that makes the hair on the back of your stint? Yeah. So the number of experimental surgeries that were done, they had trigeminal neuralgia, four years long. I couldn't make a dent on it. 
doing what I knew. And then the that was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Sub- Friday and Saturday, Subatel and Pat treated him while I was dealing with the other two. And the other two came in with histories the f- that were scary. Lyme since I was four, and then this, and then that, and then cranial cervical instability that was diagnosed with one of those video, C- that's a good face, video C-spine things. And he was an upper cervical chiropractor, so she was convinced he was correct. And it's like, and her set of symptoms, I see cranio- real cranial cervical instability. And her set of symptoms didn't match that. And then she had mold and there are there are certain symptoms you associate with mold. And then we get down to the end and what isn't in the history. So if you had mold when you were four, did you play any sports? Oh, yeah, I played soccer. Really? When? No, the next question was, when did you stop playing soccer? Oh, when things got really bad when I was 16. Did you play soccer just at school? No, I played every day, league soccer and school soccer. And then when I got to middle school, I was on class teams and school teams. And I said, wait, you played soccer 365 days a year for seven years. No, from age for nine years. And somebody told you you didn't have any concussions. Well, I was never unconscious. You understand that virtually every symptom, including if your neck is unstable, he has to prove it with proper x-rays. So he has to demonstrate instability with a medical x-ray that confirms at least some instability. Because just I've got a couple things I need to interrupt with this whole story, but how and maybe you can explain this how can you how can you determine instability based on range of motion and an x-ray it's x-ray i can understand but like video range of motion i don't understand how you can determine well, videotape the c-spine through okay. the jaw not with an apom okay and they look at it's a fluoroscope so it's in three dimensions okay you can see c1 oh yeah but the ones I have seen that said they demonstrated instability and the patient proudly showed me their video. Yeah. How do they make a diagnosis? Maybe I'm just not trained, but. Yeah, I have no idea, but any of this, I just don't understand. How. And they believe in them. They buy the fluoroscopy equipment, I think, or somebody has it. Yeah. And I the ones I've seen, I had four years of radiology, and I've seen a lot of upper cervical instability on medical x-rays. Yeah. But you have to, I think, you have to, yes, there's a video, and in order to demonstrate it with something that's been validated, you have to take, I wrote down, a to-do list. And number one, they have to redo your, how many bands do you have? They haven't redone it. She's spent a lot of money with practitioner that treated her with glutathione, which is meant to release mold from the tissues, but she wasn't given any binders. So there was that. But when he did the video, he didn't back it up with a standard medical series that at least looks at the stability side to side. Right. At, with an APOM side bending. That's a standard medical view. And at least, and flexion extension, if you're going to say C1 is unstable, you have to make sure the transverse ligament is stable right. because that's like a thing. Yeah. So I, I believe it, but. I don't know. So anyway, so that was the first one. The second, and she had COVID, and that's easy. 
but that was the other thing. The second one that I did after the first one, her major complaint was COVID vaccine reaction, COVID, COVID vaccine, COVID vaccine two, which created basically a TIA, COVID again, which made the TIA come back. And so she had parosmia. So she had the vaccine and symptoms and then had COVID and then had symptoms and had COVID again. And then vaccine number two. Okay. In the two series series. Yeah. And then COVID after that. Gotcha. COVID vaccine, COVID. And her, the most bothersome complaint was the TIA and osmia. So the only thing she could smell was smoke. And I said, okay, if the virus hits the ethmoid sinus, which is where your smell center nerves are, and it messes up every other smell you can smell, what's the most important smell that you need if you're living on the savannah or in a hunter-gatherer state? You need to be able to smell smoke. Yeah. So that is the one that's preserved. And they think of as abnormality. It's inconvenient and it's unpleasant. Right. But in our world, it's easy to get rid of. You run the virus frequencies. At least so far, I'm now five five for five or six for six. So I said, well, try what I tried before. It might not work. So treated the capillaries and the ethmoid sinus. She came in the next day, pink instead of gray, because Sue Battelle was treating the cortex, or the frequencies we have. I don't no proof that it actually addresses the cortex. Frequencies for the cortex, the sensory cortex, the vagus, the kidney, because her blood pressure went crazy after the second vaccine. Mm. And and the kidney is patients who came in with COVID back in the beginning were coming in kidney failure with elevated liver enzymes. And we paid attention to the lung symptoms because we had ventilators, right. right? But the viruses attacked the ACE2 receptor in the blood vessels and the blood vessels that res- have a response to stress which includes the kidneys and the liver, the vagus, right? Anyway, so the next night, Saturday night, she comes in without a mess, pink instead of gray, with normal sense of smell, or at least not smelling smoke. Yeah. And we just repeated. We figured out what hadn't been treated, what was left, what do you do for a TIA? And found out that she had a vestibular injury from something. So told her about prison glasses. And then we did what was basically a workshop for energetic protection. The 12 practitioners who stuck it out on a Saturday night. Neat. So I think I might have to do that again sometime. That sounds very cool. For a small group, it was really fun. Yeah. Wow. Okay. A lot, a lot to unpack there. Back to your flexibility. No, we'll go with what, where do we start? Okay. So when it, okay, let's go back to C-spine instability because okay. a lot of people come in with either a self-diagnosis of this or a diagnosis that isn't isn't medically proven with with x-rays so a lot of times i'll just ask them like how do you think i can help you with an instability in your neck or why do you think you have this and sometimes they have x-rays and sometimes they don't but a lot of times and with people with neck injuries i'm going to go back to the anxiety or the nervousness that can encompass an injury this is right from the core this is treating the emotions and the nervous tension before you can treat anything else. And I think the analogy we use in the core is something about the, putting a bandaid on a, a screaming three-year-old. 
This is exactly the energetic or emotional equivalency of a third or a three-year-old that just scraped their knee falling off the bike and they come in. I love when patients bring me everything because I feel like it's my job to diffuse the bomb like safely first before I can get in there. So when people come in with, how long is this going to take? And how long is this appointment? And how many treatments am I going to need? And I need to know, I need to put it in the calendar and you're booked up and how are you going to fit me in? And how am I going to get better? Blah, blah, blah. And I'll just say, I don't know. And like I said, anybody that tells you there's a script to follow, either A, hasn't been practicing too long or B, is trying to sell you something that you shouldn't buy. So patients that are listening, I'm going to again, go back to it. There is no secret sauce. There is no magic formula. There's a lot of factors in play. And we talked about this a couple of podcasts ago, and I want to go back to it was like the permanency, right? Like we say that a lot of the results are, or can be quite permanent. And why does that happen with FSM versus so many other things? Or how does FSM help the permanency? We have theories, right? With self-signaling. And I always use the word with that thixotropic changes with the fascia, right? That's the smush that, that is everything. So with that is, is like that stable state, the steady state, the baseline that a patient brings to us. And I don't think we talk about the emotional stability as much as we talk about diet and sleep and dietary changes it's all well and we were lucky in this class so in the circle exercise we have one of the practitioners who when i ran nine seventy and 200 i think is what i run in the circle yeah After we run 40 and 116 yeah. i ran 970 and 200 and she started tearing and I ran 40 and 562, and she started tearing. And so when we got back from lunch, I said, and quietly away from the group with the mic off, asked her, do you have a history of abuse at all? And she went, I have a bunch. Anyway, she told me the story. Yeah. And I said, okay. So I had the custom care from the clinic and the magnetic converter. I said. Put these on your lap. And we ran concussion in Vegas. And at the end of that 47 minutes, her face was completely different. And then she ran it the next day. And then she ran it again. And we ran TH because her history did make the hair on your neck stand up. Yeah. And then by Sunday, she was a completely different person. Like all the fragility was different. The strength, the who she was there. And concussion in Vegas is part of the stable state. Right. If you quiet, as you say, quiet the limbic system down and then turn the vagus on. So the vagus will tell the limbic system, dude, we're okay down here. It's fine. Yeah. And then the limbic system says, it is not. And then you run it again. No, really, it's okay. So to me, emotions and the emotional component aren't the 970s. They're concussion in Vegas. Yeah. And then if it's really difficult, you can run TH, which also has all the emotional. So it's TH plus emotional relax and balance. That's all one program. And you just run that and Usually I don't even tell them about it. I, and that's, again, going back to why it's helpful to run multiple machines is you don't really need to break down all these components. I'm going to treat your limbic system or this is, it needs to be treated. No, this is going to help your, help you relax so I can get at the tissue more comfortably. That's pretty much all the information anybody really needs to hear. And that's digestible for everybody involved. And you're reporting your clinical experience, which is valid. Totally. I'm a clinician sharing my clinical experience with other clinicians. You exactly. Know, everybody listening, patients listening. Yeah. I, I get to do that. 
It's the same thing when I was practicing before FSM. Somebody would come in late or from a meeting that was stressed out and I couldn't do anything. So we would have to just do breath work for 15, 20 minutes and just slow down, breathe. Let's try to rest and digest your lunch. Like just bringing everything right down. And it's funny, I want to talk about the rest and digest. I have so many patients who I, you start working with them, especially I always treat the abdomen before I treat the back because you need to relax everything in the front. And you hear peristalsis and gurgling. And it's, oh my God, this never happens. I don't know what's happening. I'm like, being in rest and digest, aka parasympathetics, is a great thing. You're not running from the tiger anymore. So now we can get some work done. You're like, okay, yeah. <laughs> Outstanding. I love that. Yeah. I had my first frozen shoulder absolute failure where I'm at a complete loss. And there's, I, it's because I'm so cocky with frozen shoulders. So thank you, universe, for teaching me the lesson that there are some that are just um, normally stubborn than others. So I'm I've sorry. Heard. And you're welcome. Yeah. So I don't know. Like sometimes you just have to have that. Okay. This is beyond me and my hands and my exercises and all the things I could possibly throw at it. And I don't know what this person's going to need, but I'm sending her to a very capable orthopedic surgeon colleague of mine who's fantastic. And for a surgeon, doesn't actually love operating on people, loves to try everything else first. I will let everybody know if there is something, because there has to be something that I missed. I, I really do feel strongly about that, but... One of the people that has failed at more frozen shoulders than probably anybody in our group. I'm right there with you. It's the important thing to know is when to refer them out. So now my first choice is send them to you. And if you can't fix them, find an orthopedic surgeon that is good. Yeah. And go with that. Yeah. It's so strange. I can feel everything that I still know is tight, that just doesn't respond the way that I want it to. And it's at that point too, where you're wanting it more than that. This patient is so compliant and so great and would do anything I asked and has done everything that I've asked. And we had that hard conversation this week saying, I think I'm done or let's just take a break and let's send you to somebody who I really respect and will take fantastic care of you. And so what if I came every day? I don't think... That would help, actually. I could work on you for six hours a day, every day, and you just have that feeling that this is just not going to help you. And you give them, like the first visit, you give them Codman's yeah. with half a gallon of water, and the PT has already shown them wall walking. Yeah. And people with frozen shoulder, they need to know it's going to hurt, yeah. and it's going to take six months. And if it doesn't work, then they can have surgery. And they're like, what? Yeah. And that's with FSM, at least for me. I just, frozen shoulders sucks. It and, does. and the prevalence I'm seeing of bilateral frozen shoulder is increasing. Yes. Whoa. Yes. So either bilateral at the same time or one, and then a year later, the other one. And they're not diabetic. No. And they're usually... In their 40s or yeah, mid 40s, yeah. mid to late 40s. It's always mid to late 40s, as this is interesting to me anyway, as a neuroendocrine geek. When you hit menopause, because they're usually female, yeah. When you hit menopause, your adrenals are in charge of producing everything. Yeah. You have no estrogen, you have no progesterone, it's done. Yeah. So you're Adrenals produce pregnolinone, DHEA, cortisol, progesterone, send it to the liver. The liver converts it into whatever it wants to. Right. But if you think if your adrenals are stressed, so if you look at like a salivary cortisol, yeah. see what their cortisol secretion is. But then their liver do, and vagus turns it into whatever it wants. And that may or may not be cortisol or anything that's anti-inflammatory. If they can't make, so if they had a history of 
miscarriages, endometriosis, horrible periods. The chemistry in my head says they can't phosphorylate B6. Hmm. Or if they had terrible nausea in the first trimester, they can't phosphorylate B6. That's mileage and a bunch of Jeff Bland from 20 years ago. And then the adrenals can't produce enough cortisol to keep the inflammation down. Then something happens that jacks up their inflammation, turns off their vagus. Yeah. Three to four months prior to the onset of the inflammatory stage. So what happens is they ignore the inflammatory stage when the thing still moves, but it hurts. Yes. And then because they don't use it because it hurts, it freezes. That's right. And once it's frozen, you've got a little fold at the bottom of the joint capsule. They get inflamed and that pleat fuses together. Yeah. At which point you've got the whole joint where the humeral head can't go down or glide down yeah. because the pocket isn't there. It's glued shut. Yeah. So we can try separating it, but the wall walking ex- exercises involve tearing the sucker. Yeah. And they, it hurts like crazy because as the bottom sticks and as the humeral head won't go down, you're smashing the supraspinatus tendon and bursa. Yeah. Ow. Yeah. But then going back to what started it, so it could be the first thing we do is concussion in vagus over and over again until the vagus turns down the inflammation. But then you still have the pleat that's stuck together with super glow. Totally. And so what the surgeon does is if he's smart and the patient is lucky, he'll go in and slice open, put steroids in that pocket. But then the ones I know get obsessed with it. The acromion, like the acromion was the point. Yeah. And the partial thickness tear in the supraspinatus that happened because the humeral head wouldn't go down and it got squished. So they go in and repair the supraspinatus tendon, cut off the acromion, which makes it bleed and glues the shoulder together inside it's so you have to find a surgeon where the patient will say no you don't get to cut off my acromia i don't care what you say we can do that later i'll let you do it next year if you really want to and if this doesn't get better and i have also seen patients that were just getting cortisone to help with the pain as it's either in that inflammatory state or the thawing state where the pain because you've got the the freezing and then the frozen and then the thawing. So right. in that frozen middle point, there typically isn't a ton of pain. It's just stuck, right? So this one patient has a lot of pain. She's like, I think if the pain wasn't there, I could do it. So sometimes getting these injections, whether it's a combination of cortisone and something else with biogenics that can help heal the area that gets them over the hump, but you have to have a compliant patient that's going to do all the exercises and still come in for all the therapy to manipulate the tissue that's completely adhered and glued together. Steroids and lidocaine because pain nerves sprout, but old Codman's exercises are so hard to demonstrate and they're so old school. Yeah. They just stretch yeah the capsule and that helps peel apart the stuff and it they don't hurt yeah you just get everything moving and they don't hurt but nobody i maybe nobody uses them anymore i don't know somebody has written here in the chat most frozen shoulders seem to resolve in nine to ten months The person will be in a significant change of direction in their life. And subconsciously, they are fighting the change in direction, even if consciously they want the change. The shoulder is the most flexible joint in the body. Resistance to change seems to reflect this resistance and change of direction. Nine to 10 months. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, nine to 10 months seems the average time frame for a person to accept the change at a deeper subconscious level. Steve, 
have you read Louise Hay? So when you look up frozen shoulder or shoulder problems in Louise Hay, that's exactly what she says. So it's called Heal Your Body, Heal Your Life. Yes. And for every imaginable condition, she's some sort of psychic or something. And that's exactly what she says about shoulder problems. Yeah. And it's that. Yeah. And, and that what happens in the mid 40s. And in my frozen shoulder talk that I gave, part of the talk is type one frozen shoulder, and then part is type two frozen shoulder, where it's this idiopathic onset. It's not from surgery, it's not from an injury, it's not from anything other than I don't know how it happened. And when, yeah, when you go back into the history, there is something kids going off to college, divorce, moving, something like you're you were talking about. So Infection, stress or trauma, something that turns off the vagus. And that's exactly but so even in the other type of frozen shoulder where it's oh yeah, I had this accident and then this happened, I'm still thinking of running concussion in Vegas to start with. There's really yeah. no a time where I don't feel like that's indicated. You just it's if that's the only reason you bought a second custom care. Totally. It's or a first custom care and a precision care. It's you got to do it. There's no way to fix an awful lot of what we have to fix without concussion in Vegas because the Vegas is the one that decides highly. The Vegas is the one that decides how much inflammation you need to survive the tiger. And the limbic system decides how big the tiger is. And when it appears and what it looks like. That's right. And whether, and then, yeah. I want to splice in one of the questions that we had emailed about how FSM can help with broken bones. It's, (laughs) I thought we would address it because there could be people that are brand new to this podcast that are listening right now. And how does FSM help with any type of healing? It's not just bone specific, it's healing in general. and. It's really funny, Rob DiMartino, I had him on and I had him talk about functional medicine and his approach to lay people, because I do think we have a lot of people who are not practitioners that this podcast has really crept into their living rooms. Sorry, and you're welcome. Yes. I think it's helpful to once in a while with our chats, explain things to all the patients that are listening. And so Rob did such a great job about talking about energy debt. And that's exactly how I feel like my role is in this grand scheme of helping people is giving people, bringing them to a level where they feel they are healing themselves because we've balanced that energy debt. And he talked about mitochondria and maternal mitochondria and my kids are listening and they're funny because they're just like, we're so glad you're our mom. <laughs> they have great mitochondria because of you. We love your mitochondria, mom. So I think, at, again, like going back to how we explain what FSM does, I like to say we are working, helping your body heal itself and giving you the tools and the energy to get you there. Right. And you actually have to admit that if the effect of frequencies is all in our head and we never experienced the specifics that we have experienced, even if the only thing we're doing is giving your body five times the energy it had 30 minutes ago, which is what they used to do with non specific microcurrent, then that'll help. And people stopped using microcurrent because the effects weren't predictable and they weren't sustainable. And there wasn't any context besides clinic in a case to explain it. And in the last 27 years, I've made up this story about cell signaling, finally, that explains the data we have. But it started with data. Yeah, that we had to find a way to explain. And the only thing that makes sense is the frequencies or the current give the cell five times the amount of energy, increase electron transport, increase cellular ATP, protein synthesis, amino acid transport, 
And then the frequencies tell that cell what to do with it. So if you have a partial thickness tendon tear, 124 and 77 gives you extra energy and tells the cell body, here, this will fix apparently what's busted that is making you secrete all those cytokines. Here, let us help you along. And no, it's not a one visit fix, but if they're smart and they don't break it again, yeah, and you fix why it was broken in the first place, then it'll heal much faster because the frequencies tell it what to do. How do you know that? We have this cytokine data that it took us 20 years to explain. And then there's this data. And then there's that data about yeah. a completely different condition and a completely different situation. So how is it going to help broken bones? I got no data except for Tara Owens. I get to talk about him. Yeah. Open spiral fracture that healed in six weeks. That's not possible. Yeah. Other fractures, you get them two weeks later. It's going to reduce the pain, but it's not going to increase the healing at all. Oh, oh that's so funny. One more chat, and then I've got another thing to move on to. Oh, going back to the frozen shoulder. Let's talk about this. Speaking from personal experience with myself and my wife, she's had it in one shoulder for nine months, and then it moved to the other shoulder. The first shoulder resolved as if it wasn't there. One year, she is pegging clothes on the clothesline with one arm. The next year, it was with the other arm. I've learned not to treat frozen shoulder as I rarely make a difference. And usually 12 months later, it resolved itself. They have physioacupuncture, treatment, et cetera, shift in deeper consciousness and which seems to, which seems difficult to speed up resolves a manifestation of resistance to change. Dave, you, I, I encourage you to go read Louise Hay, Heal Your Body, Heal Your Life. And you'll find exactly that in certain patients some people it's mechanical they right. have diabetes they've used steroids for asthma they get out out avascular necrosis because they used steroids for asthma there's so many causes and the people that are so are committed to an emotional component to everything is the cause are wrong yeah i hate to say it but no it's not always emotional. Sometimes it is, and you have to figure that out. Yeah. And if it is, and you get lucky the first two times you treat people, and it's the emotional component, then you get lucky and you become committed to that being the only component. And right. for a seminar, one of the things my job is to take your mind and pry it away from your commitment to that one thing that worked on that one or six patients and introduce you to the patients where that wasn't the problem and it was something simple like 40 and 396 and nerve pain. Derek says emotional yeah. component, yes, correlation between the beginning of some type of trauma, majority of time an emotional trauma of some kind is manifested into a physical issue. That's right. And Derek what turns off the vagus nerve? Infection, stress, and trauma. Yes. And it doesn't matter if it's emotional trauma, physical trauma, imagined stress, or real stress. Yes. That turns off the vagus. That turns up inflammation. That turns up your worry about it, how much it scares you. Yes. That compounds the problem. So you yeah. treat concussion in vagus and you feed them phosphatidylcholine. And that increases acetylcholine. Give them some GABA to help the midbrain quiet down, reduced glutamate. And then the physical component is easier because the frequencies work on the emotional component from where they actually start, which is the limbic system and the vagus. And that's if you can treat them all at the same time, then they're a wizard. You're a wizard. Yeah. They leave stoned. Yeah. They have the same injury, but they don't care about it the same way. And it makes the physical work so much easier. And the number of times in that seminar when I said, I'm sorry, and you're welcome, 
I give you credit every single time. There's at least, I don't know, five or six times. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. The look on their face was, oh my God. And I went, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. And you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a true statement. And again, not to go crazy with the frozen shoulder talk today, but like your intent, like my intent as a practitioner is never to say I'm going to cure your frozen shoulder. No. Oh. My job. So it's not to say to somebody, oh, it typically lasts nine to 10 months and you're stuck with it and there's nothing I can do. I get it. It's to help the symptoms of the frozen shoulder. So whether it is to give them tools to self massage, self mobilize, relax, any of those tools. So like you're never, I hope nobody's ever selling them on the fact that I'm going to fix your frozen shoulder in one treatment. That's never going to happen, but it has never happened where I haven't made a dent in it. Oh yeah. Now I've failed so many times. I stopped counting. And it's, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Cause I, I can usually do something to at least buy them a week of yeah. reduction or mobility. Oh. But Whatever. There's another question that I want to make sure we get to. Louise writes, unrelated to frozen shoulder, son had a cone beam scan done, outstanding holistic periodontist, massive sinus infection yep. by one of his wisdom teeth. Um, yep. Heart relationship last year, he had myocarditis post getting COVID one month after getting Pfizer booster. So this Friday, he will have two wisdom teeth removed ozone cleaning prp under anesthesia at my side yes. what frequencies do you recommend to help minimize swelling he's fine to go back next week on wednesday in the custom care mode bank there's a whole series on it's called bony oral surgery i okay. think there is something like that it should be i should have started it with post-op but you'll find it on their bony oral surgery And it's why I could have nine jaw surgeries with no swelling and no bruising. Amazing. Yeah. And you run it. They put the sticky pads on your zygomatic arch and on your clavicles. And you run the frequency to stop bleeding literally when you get in the chair. Yeah. Not when you get in the chair, but as you get out of the chair before you wake up from the anesthesia. And during the surgery. You put magnetic converter on or sticky pads on his stomach and Mary Ellen developed a surgical systemic to be run during the surgery that supports the adrenals, supports detoxification of the anesthetic. So when you wake up, you don't feel like you've been run over by a truck for two days. And yeah, I can't give the number of the protocol, it's going to be up in the 300 someplace, but the number doesn't. If you type in the word bony oral surgery or oral surgery, something will come up. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not that hard, but thank. And what you should add are the virus frequencies in the vagus and virus frequencies in the sinuses. And maybe the heart. So myocarditis after getting COVID and he got COVID one month after getting the Pfizer booster. So no discussion about that. And wisdom teeth tend to get infected. So the ozone and PRP should help, but it wouldn't. It's really hard to get antibiotics into the bone marrow back there. Yeah. So sometimes they'll, the ozone is usually enough. And then just run the bony oral surgery. And you spend a lot of time the first day or two just stopping the bleeding in the soft tissue and the bone, repairing the tendon. Because wisdom teeth are way in the back and you have to almost damage the pterygoid tendon that pulls on the disc in order to get that surgery done because they block their mouth open. Yeah. 
So you think about the tissues that are injured and preemptively treat them as soon as they come out of the procedure. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's all in the mode bank protocol, I want to say. Yeah. And you might have to, if you've taken the core, Louise, you might happen that you might have to take add just 124 and 77 for that pterygoid. There's no way to do that surgery without injuring it, I don't think. It doesn't necessarily injure the disc as long as the pterygoid doesn't get annoyed at having... I was going to say, it ends up being a sprained ankle in your jaw. Yeah, pretty much. It's yeah. Nice that you just have such a... And I talk about a disc injury in the neck or low back. Yes. Yeah. So having a sprained ankle in your neck. The important right. thing is... You don't do anything stupid in the next six weeks and it'll help, it'll heal in six weeks. How does it do that when I've had it for two years? Have you ever not looked down in two years? Oh, I look down all the time. Yeah, not in the next two weeks. Right. Or six weeks. Why not? Because you're not allowed. Right. You cannot lift a full gallon of milk. Why? You're not allowed. Yeah. <laughs> you use two hands, keeps your elbow at your side, lift it out of the fridge, or you have your 14-year-old son or your husband do it. I yeah. can't wait that long. Then bust your dick again, disc again, and we'll start over next week. Oh, you get to choose what's more important, the gallon of milk or your neck. And you put it into that perspective and it's, oh, nothing stupid in the next six weeks. It's such a fine line between, and we talked, talked about this a couple of podcasts ago as well, of like giving patients the power back. And again, it goes full circle to what we started with was anxiety and I need to have this formula and I need to have this plan and I need to know, I need to know, I need to know. Yeah, you are not powerless. Like we, but there is some that you need to just relax and let go of. But here are the bits and pieces that you do get to control. So again, it goes back to the toddler that wants to play with all the toys all the time. No. He can play with some toys. You, these are yours to play with right now. Okay. I get some toys to play with. You get toys to play with. These are yours. Okay. So sometimes it's just like you can't control all the pieces of it, but you can control some very important components. So our jobs as practitioners is to give them those rules and boundaries and parameters. Like these are the safe exercises. These are the rules in which you get to recover from. But the rest of it is just going to take time. We don't know. And the other gift that you can give them is reframing. Right. Is there every injury that's come, at least come into my life and every patient I've ever met, every injury that comes into your life has something to teach you. Yeah. And the normal healing, it's almost like grieving, the normal healing from a chronic injury as they get better, as they recover from fibromyalgia, let's say. And it takes three to four months, thank God. Yeah. It's hard enough when they get out of pain in 60 minutes. Yeah. But as they recover, the first thing that happens is they get angry. Why did I have to suffer? And why did this have to happen? And then why did, and then they get angry at the people that told them it was all in their head and just prescribing drugs that made them stupid. And then they have resentment and then they have grief for the part of their life that they lost. And it's a predictable sequence and it can happen in 15 minutes or it can happen over several weeks. And then at some point I just stop them. Yeah. And everything that comes in your life comes there because you need to learn a lesson. Right. Huh? Yep. Okay, what did you learn? Nothing. Okay, did you learn that you actually don't have to mop the floor to be a good person? Oh, yeah, I haven't mopped the floor in four years. My son does it. My husband does it. He hates it, and I feel bad. It's okay. But did the world come to an end? No, actually. Okay. Did you take out the trash? I couldn't lift anything. Okay, so you found out the world was not going to come to an end if you don't take out the trash? found out the world isn't going to come to an end and you still have friends if you can't go to the party and you can't do this and you can't do that. You have a vestibular injury, so you really can't go to the movies or play or, right? And you learned empathy. Do you, now that you've been in a wheelchair and now you're out, how do you feel about the guy that you see in the wheelchair? Oh, totally different than I did before. I said, okay, so you have more empathy than you did before. 
is there any way you could have learned that without having been in a wheelchair for three months? Maybe not. Okay, so you learned a lot of really valuable things now that you finished the learning part. You get to keep the wisdom. And we just got rid of the condition. So you can, and actually, once you reframe it, the anger just disappears. You don't have to. Yeah. Be, I've already used the frequencies, so the pressure's out of it. But reframing is just what you learn. Yeah. Well, I can live my life without raising my shoulder. Okay. And that pain is something that you have to live with and work through. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes you have to have your hip replaced. Yeah. Caught it too late. Should have been replaced two years ago. Look at the x-ray. I can't help you. Yeah. There's no cartilage and you have cysts in the fem femoral head. It's done. Yeah. Five years ago? Maybe. So it's I those it's conversations. Thing, but you can get the surgery and I can't wait to help you after for all your post-op care. Oh, here's the custom care. Yeah. And it's a deal breaker. You find yourself an orthopedic surgeon that will let you use a custom care and a magnetic converter in the hospital within four hours of the time of the surgery. And if he says no, you go find another surgeon that isn't Jack. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is a nice guy. Yes. Yeah, it won't hurt you. And then you can tell him it's a TENS unit. There's data that says if you use a TENS unit after surgery, it improves outcomes. That's data. You're protected. Yeah. You give them that information, they go talk to the surgeon, and, they, and it's not that hard to find one that'll let you. Right. You put in the studies. Couple so, of, we are out of time, but let's get to some. No. Yes. Oh, sorry. Or, so Robert wrote something about stress incontinence after two difficult births, referring to PT specializing in pelvic floor. Any FSM suggestions? 124 and 77. Yeah, it's torn over connective tissues. And yeah. 124, 142, and the fascia. Fascia and the connective tissue, and that pelvic floor is. 80, 124? Or... Yeah. Uh, yeah, 124 and then 81. Yeah. But fixing the. Torn and broken in the fashion, torn and broken in the connective tissue, and actually do actually do pelvic floor exercises. With 81 running. Yeah. And there's some other more intimate things you can do that I can't describe on uh, radio. But podcast. the pelvic floor PT. <laughs> pelvic floor P PT will tell them how to do that. Yeah. Perfect. You're welcome, Leif. Glad you enjoy it. I don't have music running in my treatment room because it's too distracting and I'm 280. I do have music and I change it with each patient. So sometimes it's like acoustic guitar because I have some patients that really like the music, especially when I'm doing movement. Certain beats and rhythms help coordinate movement and balance. So I change it on a case by case basis. Oh, that's better. Yeah, mine's always silent. I want the patient actually in their body. Yes, that's a good point. But yeah, I like the fact that you change it every patient. That's excellent. It's four o'clock already. It is. It is. So that's it for today. Yeah. I'm not sure if I am here next Wednesday. I have to go double check that because I might be on a plane, but I will let everybody know and I'll let you know way ahead of time. The last time. We just, I just answered questions for an hour or so. And I'm sure that's fantastic. Yes, the fifth, I will not be here. I am on an airplane. Okay, I'm here. So I'll do the best I can. Everybody bring their questions next week and you'll have a fun and informative private Q&A session. That'll be fun. Yoda, yes. Who doesn't want to do that? And then I'm gone the week after that. I don't know. Anyway, and the, the new website, is the new website is launched and it is fantastic. So yeah. there are practitioners listening. The find a practitioner section of the website is improved and will just make sure that your listing has all of the courses you've taken, all the correct practitioner information. How many hits a year does it have? Say 50,000. About 50. Vaguely, I remember 80, but let's say 50,000 a year. So there's 50,000 patients a year in the U.S. looking for you. Sometimes they're in Europe looking for somebody in Europe. But 
check the website. It looks great. This company did a great job. We've spent a year and a half in updating it. There's just so much information on that website. It was just like jumbled. It was I, stuffing it all into one spot was difficult. So and yeah. so now there's a I'm a patient section and I'm a practitioner section. Yes. And practitioner webinars are all there. The videos are all there. It's just Kevin did such a great job with them. After the first six months, all I did was pay the bills. And Kevin did all the work. So it, it's awesome. And the graphic did, did the work. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And I will see you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. Happy plane ride. May you not sleep in the airport. Yes, thank you. I'll put that may up. You get on the, may you get on the plane safely. Thank you. And on okay. Bye. 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 The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.